Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our event in honor of Hobbit Day. Happy Hobbit Day, everybody. Uh, I'm KJ. I'm the director for the C.S. Lewis Institute here in Chicago. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. This is uh, one in a long series of online events we've been hosting in partnership with our colleagues from the C.S. Lewis Institute in Atlanta. We have been partnering to um, bring you uh, experts and scholars in the works of C.S. Lewis and now J.R.R. Tolkien. And we're excited to bring um, this event to explore the uh, Christian worldview in the writings of uh, Tolkien and in Middle Earth. Uh, to guide us through tonight's event with our speaker, uh, I want to introduce our host tonight, Bill Smith, the director of the C.S. Lewis Institute in Atlanta. Uh, he's been in Atlanta for about uh, 17 or 18 years as the director. You've been there much longer, of course, um, but more importantly, been a good friend of mine. I want to thank you for leading us and um, inviting your good friend, uh, Dr. Williams, into this with us tonight, Bill. Tonight, I want to welcome Dr. Williams. And so um, if uh, you could join us, Dr. Williams, uh, I'll, I'll ask you a few questions of introduction well, hey, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, maybe uh, where you grew up and uh, and then uh, leading up into your your education and then your teaching experience. And uh, and then I'll ask you something about your writing and speaking. OK, well, uh, I was born in Norfolk, Virginia. My parents moved to uh, the Atlanta area when I was one. So for all practical purposes, I've been a native Georgian all that time. I uh, grew up in a Christian family, uh, walked the aisle of a little country Baptist church uh, when I was five years old, accepted Christ as my Savior, and uh, didn't, of course, fully understand what that meant. It was just, that's what I had been taught that God wanted me to do, and so I did it. And... Uh, but it started a real relationship with the Lord that has persisted ever since, mainly because of his grace and his persistence rather than mine. In my high school years, I went through a, a kind of a crisis of, of faith. I was starting to ask questions like, well, how do we know this is true? And uh, it wasn't so much the inability to answer those questions on the part of my Sunday school teachers, etc., that gave me a problem. It was their attitude toward the questions themselves. It's like, if you were really spiritual, you wouldn't be asking stuff like that. You just need to read your Bible more and pray harder. And that was having the opposite effect of what they intended. That was really driving me away from the faith because I was thinking, you know, if, if you are made this insecure, by the questions of a snot-nosed kid, how can what you're telling me possibly be true? And I never gave up the faith. The Lord had a hold of me, but I was really struggling with it. And uh, fortunately, about that time, uh, I ran across uh, The Lord of the Rings. It was uh, the summer of 1968, summer between my junior and senior year of high school, and Everybody was wearing Frodo Lives buttons, and, and I was wondering what this was all about. And so I checked the uh, trilogy out of the library and read it and was totally absorbed by that. And then, uh, fortunately, uh, somebody said, in the providence of God, somebody said, you know, if you like Tolkien, you should check out his friend, C.S. Lewis. And, and so I went to the library that's what you did back in those days uh, to actually get books. I went to the library and most of the Lewis was checked out. Uh, the, on, the, the first book that came into my hands was an experiment in criticism. Uh, there's only one other person in the world I know of for whom that was their first Lewis book. So I'm, yeah, I'm a high school student. I'm reading an experiment in criticism. Uh, and, it was written in such a way that I could understand it. It was, uh, it was clear. It was interesting. It wasn't answering any of my questions about the faith, uh, but it was explaining uh, the depths of the reaction I was having to Tolkien. Uh, and so 
I went on to uh, Mere Christianity, Miracles, Problem of Pain, the Space Trilogy, and the rest of Lewis. And it was God's way of providing the answer that my teachers in the church uh, were not able to provide. Uh, the most important thing about Lewis was the fact that it wasn't so much the answers he was giving to those questions. How do we know this is true? Although they were good answers. But the most important thing was simply the fact that he demonstrated that a Christian mind was actually possible. Mm -hmm. Christian mind is not an oxymoron. At mm -hmm. least one has existed. <laughs> and I had uh, stumbled across it. Uh, went on from there to people like Francis Schaeffer. Uh, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I majored in English uh, as an undergraduate uh, because I realized that although Tolkien was the greatest writer of fantasy, there was a lot of other really good stuff that was worth reading too. I went on to seminary got a master's degree in theology, ended up at the University of Georgia, go dogs, national champions, uh, defending it well so far, uh, got a PhD in medieval and Renaissance literature. I was actually trying to follow in Lewis's footsteps. Um, and so I was trying to recreate the education that had made it possible for him to have the impact uh, on me that he had had and it would it couldn't be done i started too late mm -hmm. you know, i mean i uh i studied uh latin greek hebrew anglo-saxon german and spanish uh i'm still pretty competent in old english i read old english competently middle english fluently and modern english with great difficulty uh i can still do greek and latin uh, a lot of that stuff you know, it's like I, I could not keep that many languages functioning at the same time in my head. It wasn't big enough to hold them all. Mm -hmm. It really, really helped to teach me how brilliant people like Lewis and Tolkien actually were. Mm -hmm. So I utterly failed um, to reproduce Lewis's education using uh, discarded image as my guide. But that failure put me ahead of the game as far as a lot of my contemporaries were concerned, I think, who uh, didn't realize the importance of those things. And so the smattering of it that I managed to get uh, has, I think, stood me in good stead. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been a border dweller. Uh, I stay permanently camped out on the border between theology and literature, between pastoral ministry and serious scholarship, Narnia and Middle Earth, mm -hmm. and uh, it's the the cross fertilization of those things that uh, Lewis really made possible. Lewis and Tolkien really made possible for me that I think has been the the source of any insights I've had that have been uh, worthwhile at all. Uh, I spent some time in the pastorate. Uh, ended up at uh, Tacoa Falls College as the medieval and renaissance guy in their English department. And so I was making my my career kind of schizophrenic, like I'm making my money teaching literature and then teaching the Bible uh, on the side. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've spent uh, quite a few summers in Africa and India, Uganda, Kenya, India for uh, Church Planting International, training local pastors in those countries. Uh, I've had a uh, really uh, interesting, uh, fun side career as a, as a Christian apologist and, and theologian. And uh, so I, I think it put me in a position or in a place where I could profitably uh, do the work I've done on Lewis's theology in Deeper Magic, the theology behind the writings of C.S. Lewis, and the Christian worldview in Tolkien. Um, those, uh, you know, you, you, 
Lewis scholars tend to either be lit people or theology people. Lit people who do the lit, theology people who do the popular apologetics. Uh, but I think to really do Lewis justice, you have to be both. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've managed to get a smattering of both along the way. And the same thing was very helpful in, in working on the book on Tolkien. Yeah, so mention it, just to mention uh, Deeper Magic. Um, we're, we are actually October the 27th. Uh, we have scheduled for uh, another one of these Zoom meetings where uh, we'll talk about deeper magic. So uh, the theology and the writings of C.S. Lewis. And, and I also have to say, having read that book uh, and having read the book and reread parts of it numerous times, mm. it's uh, does a really good job of giving a synopsis of Lewis, not, not only giving a synopsis of Lewis's theological views, but um, also some places where you might uh, differ with Lewis, um, you know, on some particular issues in a very um, helpful way. So looking well, forward, look, looking forward to that as well. It's the only book on Lewis's theology that is comprehensive and uh, that is analytical and critical. That is critical in the sense of mostly appreciation. Mm -hmm. If I go through, basically, if you look at the table of contents of that book, it looks like the table of contents for a standard systematic theology text. Mm -hmm. And I go through those topics and, and the entirety of Lewis's uh, literary production, the, the popular apologetics, the literary scholarship, the fiction, uh, and his letters, and try to... to uh, discover, okay, what did Lewis teach about this? And what are its strengths and weaknesses as a guide to biblical truth mm -hmm. uh, from a conservative evangelical perspective? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of strengths and a few weaknesses, and I try mm -hmm. to be fair uh, about all of it. Uh, but, you know, uh, the other books on Lewis's theology are either... Uh, just pure summary, almost pure summary, like Will Voss's mm -hmm. uh, Mere Theology. Uh, it's a good summary. It's an accurate summary. And if you want a summary, it, it's it's a good book. But mm -hmm. it doesn't really give you a lot of analysis or critique. Or then you have the more scholarly books that look at, at, at one doctrine or one little set of doctrines rather mm -hmm. than covering the, the whole topic. So, Yeah, well, um, let's jump right in uh, to this book and mm -hmm. maybe you could talk about some of the main themes. I know uh, right at the, uh, the beginning of the book, you talk about some of the main themes of uh, mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings. And um, so uh, it, talk it, about some of those. It's a companion to deeper magic in a way, but it, it doesn't have the same level of detail because Tolkien was not a popular theologian and apologist like Lewis. And so you can't really derive a full theology legitimately from Tolkien's uh, legendarium. But the biblical worldview is there very strongly. And uh, the way I discovered that really, uh, really, I think, tells you a lot about the nature of, of what's there. When I first read the Lord of the Rings, uh, the summer of 1968, you know, I, I was going through that, that, uh, spiritual crisis and I was, uh, trying to find a way where a Christian could actually be a person with an active inquiring mind who was open to the beauty of, of nature, the beauty of art and culture and literature. And, that first time through, I had no idea that Tolkien was a Christian, no idea that he was a believer. And I kept thinking, you know, if a Christian ever saw the, uh, the wonder and the beauty of, of these things and, and had an active living mind, this is how he might write. And then I would say, no, nah, not possible. Nothing in my experience of the church had let me believe any such thing could possibly be. Uh, 
And then <clears throat> uh, and there were five basic elements that were making me think that. Uh, the first is the, the way the symbolism of darkness and light is used in those works. Now, darkness and light are natural symbols of good and evil that appear in any kind of literature. So just the fact that they're there doesn't point to a Christian understanding of the world, doesn't point to a biblical worldview. But there were certain aspects of the way Tolkien used them. And what I'm doing, of course, now is I'm reading a lot of content back into my adolescent mind that wasn't there yet. Uh, things that I've discovered as I've thought about it since then. But uh, darkness and light are not simply natural phenomena that are equal. Uh, Sam sees the star that pierces his heart with beauty in Mordor and all the darkness. And the insight comes to him that there's no way Sauron can actually conquer light with his darkness. Darkness and light are not on equal footing. Now, if they're just natural phenomena, if we have a secular world, that makes no sense. So they're both just there, you know, and, and the universe will end in heat death and there will be no more light forever. Darkness is going to win. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a, uh, a pagan or pantheistic, semi-pantheistic, panentheistic universe, like the, the world of Star Wars, for example, uh, where the light and dark sides of the force are both part of the same force, the light side, the dark side of the force, and uh, there can be no final victory for light it's you simply have to restore balance to the force so that uh, darkness doesn't completely overwhelm everything. Uh, you know, at the end of the first, the original trilogy, you know, the, the Death Star is blown up, we, the good guys win, and we're all uh, singing hallelujah and rejoicing, and it's a great story. But then you have to have the other episodes, and you begin discovering that that no, there can't be that kind of victory, that kind of hallelujah moment, mm -hmm. because light and dark are just equally sides of the same force. And so only if there is a theistic and indeed Christian uh, philosophical foundation on which Middle Earth is built, mm -hmm. do Sam's insights make sense? Now, this was in 1968. This is just a hunch. It's not anywhere near as articulate as what I'm saying now. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it was like there was something there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm explaining what I eventually, through a long process, discovered yeah. to be. So you have it's very subtle. Go ahead. It's, it's very subtle in the um, in the book. It's uh, in the you know in the book itself, uh, or even in the movie, you know, the scene where the dark clouds are going by and he, and Sam looks up and there's a star he sees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's kind wow. of above, you know, and beyond the darkness, there's still the light. You know, Though here at journey's end, I lie in darkness buried deep beyond all towers, strong and high beyond all mountains, steep. Above all shadows rides the sun and stars forever dwell. I will not say the day is done. Nor <laughs> bid the stars farewell. So uh, that's not explicitly Christian, but it is a form of hope that no other worldview except a theistic and Christian worldview can actually support. And I think this becomes very clear when you uh, compare the use of these things in the Lord of the Rings with, with a non-Christian world like the world of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I love Star Wars, um, but you have to understand that its philosophical foundations are not worked out in the same way. And, and the contrast, I think, is very instructive. The second 
uh, motif is the strength of weakness. Um, it's not the great uh, wizards. It's not the great warriors. It's not the great forces in Middle Earth that matter. It's the hobbits who are mm. weak. And uh, Elrond, in, in sending them forth, says, you know, this quest can be accomplished by the weak as well as the strong. Indeed, this is the way of things that uh, in, in times like this, it's the weak who have to rise up and defend us. And so as I'm reading through and I'm seeing uh, that it's actually through the weakness which becomes strength when it's dedicated to the, the right cause, uh, that victory is won. And I just keep hearing this verse from the scriptures echoing in my head, not by my, not by power, but by my strength, says the Lord. And so uh, that's another element <coughs> that doesn't by itself make this a Christian work, but is uh, resonates very strongly with the biblical uh, emphasis and passages. The role of sacrifice. Um, Frodo has to give the Shire up so that others may keep it. Uh, he is wounded horribly, and it's through that wounding that victory is finally won for everybody else. Uh, it's not an atonement. It's not an exact parallel to uh, the death of Christ in Scripture, but uh, a freely made sacrifice uh, for the good of others that has a terrible cost and is accepted out of love. Uh, again, that's another element that uh, resonates strongly with uh, the content of Scripture. I think maybe the, the one that pulls it all together, the fourth theme, is the theme of providence. Uh, Gandalf, trying to explain to Frodo what's going on, says, look, Bilbo was meant, I can put it no clearer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker. And that may be an encouraging thought. Well, it doesn't encourage Frodo all that much <laughs> at the time. And my uh, adolescent self was saying, encouraging thought, what's encouraging about that? Well, if, if Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker, there had to be somebody who meant this. Uh, meaning, intention, purpose, those are all uh, inherently, essentially personal things, uh, realities. You can't have them without a person behind them. So a rock that falls off a cliff and hits me in the head hurts, but I can't blame the rock. It's just following the law of gravity. It didn't mean to do that. On the other hand, if that same rock was thrown by an enemy, who did it with malice aforethought, that's a very, very different situation indeed. Mm -hmm. And the, the malice aforethought, the purpose, the meaning, the intention, only persons can mean things, only persons can intend things. Well, the implication is there is someone at work behind the scenes who's more powerful than Sauron, and this is an encouraging thought because it means we're not on our own. We're not, by, you know, if if all Gandalf has is this cockamamie scheme of sending a couple of tomfool hobbits into Mordor with the ring, we we're I mean we're toast. You know, if you, if you look at that from a purely secular standpoint, like like um, Denethor does, for example, it's nothing but a fool's hope. But if Gandalf has some kind of insight into something else at work behind the scenes that has purpose and that has power behind it, uh, then what is a fool's hope becomes the brilliant uh, strategy for actually defeating Sauron that it turns out to be. Uh, either Gandalf is a complete idiot who just turns out to be more lucky than anybody 
can believe, or he has some insight into what's going on. Now, you don't discover what that is, and you don't discover the truth of it until you get the Silmarillion, uh, which came out about 10 years later. Uh, and so it, it was, you know, in 68, it's like, uh, there's something going on here. I'm not quite sure what it is. But then we discover Gan Gandalf is a Maya. Uh, he's a supernatural uh, sort of semi-angelic being, uh, not as powerful as the Valar, but a servant of the Valar. And as one of those uh, children of Iluvatar, he was present at the great music in the beginning. He knows that things are moving toward a final chord and a resolution. He has insight into these kinds of things that are what enable him to be the source of hope for the free peoples of Middle-earth. And, uh, of course, when you read the Silmarillion and you get the creation story, uh, that, that was one of those moments that just totally blows, blew me away. Uh, all of the uh, hunches turn out not to just be hunches, but turn out to be real insights into the central meaning of the whole thing as is revealed. It's only implied in the Lord of the Rings. Iluvatar, God, is never mentioned one time. Uh, he's only hinted at. But when you get to the Silmarillion, now, okay, now we know what Gandalf was talking about. And we see that the way this plot works is not by being unbelievably lucky, but by real wisdom that comes from real insight into the nature of the world and the nature of reality and its relationship to the one, the Luvatar. Uh, so, yeah, the theme of providence really pulls all that together. Mm -hmm. And then, then finally... <clears throat> um, I hesitate to even say this because I don't know how to say it without uh, people misunderstanding me. Uh, a lot of people have talked about Christ figures in the Lord of the Rings, and I think that's a misleading term. I don't think there is a Christ figure. Uh, Tolkien said uh, that he would never have dared to try to write such a thing. Uh, but there are three characters that correspond to three aspects of the biblical understanding of Christ, the traditional uh, theological uh, analysis of Christ as, as having three offices of prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, he's the one who reveals God to us. Uh, priest, he's the one who makes the sacrifice, which leads to our atonement. And he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, so you have uh, Gandalf, who takes on the role of the prophet. Frodo, and to a lesser extent, Sam, take on the role of the priest. And Aragorn, of course, is the king. The hands of the king are the hands of a healer. Uh, and so shall the rightful king be known. Uh, they're not... Tolkien wisely didn't create a Christ figure because that would have been a character nobody could have fully believed in. It would have been putting too much of a burden on any one character. Mm -hmm. But you have characters that remind you of aspects of Christ who kind of corporately uh, resemble aspects of, of him not accidentally, but because Tolkien had absorbed uh, the, the character of the true hero with a capital H from the biblical text. And this gets reflected in the way these people uh, function in, in the story. So uh, I read The Lord of the Rings. I noticed these five things uh, as I reread re it. Uh, and I, I've uh, I read it twice in '68. The very first thing I did after finishing it was go back to the beginning and read all the way through to the end of the appendices, every single word, 
that's going to stand for it to be over. And I've read it almost every year since. Uh, became a kind of a became kind of a ritual. Uh, every summer, I would read the Lord, the Hobbit, the, Sil the Silmarillion, the Hobbit, and the Lord of the Rings as a way of, of cleaning out my mind from all the garbage that had accumulated after nine months of grading freshman essays. <laughs> and uh, if I have any uh, grip on sanity remaining, I owe a lot of it to that practice. I highly recommend it. So, so you know, as with each one of those readings, those things that I've been talking about, the five motifs came into sharper focus. Uh -huh. Uh, and then as, after I'd read it the second time, boy, you've got to go uh, grab everything else. You know, when you when a writer moves you like that, you, you've got to find everything else he wrote. In 1969, by this time, it's not, uh, there's not that much, but there was a collection called the Tolkien Reader, and it did contain the essay on fairy stories, mm -hmm. uh, where Tolkien gives his philosophy of literature and he talks about um, he talks about the doctrine of subcreation that why do human beings tell stories and, and listen to stories and create stories and create other kinds of art we make because we're made in the image of the maker although now long as strange man is not wholly lost nor wholly changed Disgraced he may be, yet is not dethroned, and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned. Man, sub-creator, the refracted light uh, from many hues. Uh, no, shoot, I'm losing the thread of the poem. Uh, but it ends up saying that uh, this right of creation has not decayed. We make still by the law in which we're made. And I just slammed that book shut. I had to go out for a walk because I suddenly realized Tolkien's whole view of, of the fairy story of literature, of its significance, was based on very explicitly Christian doctrine, the doctrine of the creation of man in the image of God. And so we create because we're made in the image of the creator, uh, because of our fall, we corrupt that creation sometimes, but it still is part of our identity. And uh, so that was the first uh, moment where it's like a, a bolt of lightning just illuminated the whole world. And I saw it in a new way. Then when you get to the Silmarillion and read the creation story of Middle Earth, uh, Again, all of that is, is completely confirmed. Uh, now, if I'm, I'm not just reading this stuff in there. Uh, Tolkien himself said famously that um, the Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally, interesting adjective, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. Uh Catholic, referring to the Roman Catholicism, which was the church Tolkien belonged to, the form of Christianity he espoused. He said, it's a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously in the beginning, but consciously in the revisions. Now, that's very interesting. Unconsciously in the beginning means he didn't set out to write an allegory. It's not an allegory. Uh, he set out to tell a, a great story. Mm -hmm. But consciously in the revisions means that as he worked on it over the years, he became aware of how his own deepest convictions and beliefs were informing the philosophical underpinnings and superstructure and the moral structure of that world and took deliberate steps to strengthen them to make sure that uh, those who were looking for it could find it unconsciously in the beginning, but consciously in the revisions, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. And so, uh, you know, it, it, the spirituality that's there uh, 
isn't Christian in the sense that uh, it directly reflects Christian theology or Christian teaching. Uh, Middle Earth is a history of this world in a pre-Old Testament era. Okay. But, uh, so it's not an allegory. It's not uh, explicitly teaching Christian doctrine the way Lewis often does. And yet, uh, as I said, the, the, the philosophical, the metaphysical, and the ethical substructure on which this world is built is explicitly, uh, it's, it's, not just gen, it's not just generically spiritual. It's not pagan. Uh, there are a lot of, of neo-pagans who, who love the work and uh, want to find their own belief reflected in it. And, and they put a lot of stress on the Valar, who are uh, sometimes called gods, although it's clear from the Anulandale, the creation story, that they're much more like the angels in, uh, in the Jewish or Christian scriptures. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, a work that I, I think people love it so much. And people find themselves invested in it the way they do because it lets them live in a world where hope is meaningful, where hope has foundations, where there are grounds for hope. Uh, and Gandalf uh, reveals those. Frodo and Sam embrace them, as, as do all uh, the great heroes, Aragorn, etc., uh, they embrace that hope and they they risk everything for it, and it doesn't let them down. Uh, in a secular world, there's no basis for that. Uh, you know, if if, so, if we're the way we are because we evolved this way. And evolution's going to fix it? Well, yeah, you only got a few billion years more to wait for that to happen. Not much hope there. Uh, in, in, in a pagan universe, every pagan creation story that I've ever read, and I've read a lot of them, is some version of in the beginning was nature. Uh, the, the Babylonian creation story, for example, uh, in the beginning was Apsu and Tiamat, the primordial of freshwater and saltwater seas. The freshwater, the masculine principle, impregnates the feminine saltwater, and from their sexual union are born the gods. So in the beginning was nature, and the gods then are part of nature, just like we are. They're stronger, they're immortal, but they don't... Uh, occupy a position in which they can guarantee a positive outcome to history. Uh, we need hope. And the Lord of the Rings lets us visit a world in which hope can be real. Not everybody obviously sees how it's doing that, that it's, it's doing that by building doing its world building on the foundation of uh, biblical truths, the biblical worldview, but they feel the impact of it. Uh, and I, it, I think it's, it's uh, certainly been very uh, meaningful and, and mm -hmm. uh, life-changing for me to come to see a little bit about how that's working and why it's mm -hmm. working. So in the in the book, you talk about uh, um, contrasting, kind of comparing poetry, history, and philosophy. And so talk about uh, how those three relate to each other and um, why that distinction is uh, important as it relates to the Lord of the Rings. That comes up in the chapter on uh, the the relationship between Tolkien's version of the story and Peter Jackson's. Uh, because uh, I explain uh, 
the changes that Jackson makes to the story uh, as, as flowing from a philosophy of literature that is different from the one Tolkien had. Tolkien uh, looked at literature the way uh, Christians have looked at it uh, at least since uh, Sir Philip Sidney's defense of poesy. Uh, Sidney said that uh, Sidney was writing a defense of poesy, and he meant by that not just poetry, but imaginative literature, poetry or prose. And, and why is it important? Well, he said, if you're, you're uh, thinking about your education, uh, there are three aspects of it. There's, there's uh, history, and there's philosophy, and there's poetry. Uh, by poetry, he means literature. So uh, history tells you about what has happened. But the historian, as a historian, he knows what has happened, but he can't tell you what should have happened or what ought to happen. So he deals with reality. Then you have the philosopher who deals with the ideal. The philosopher says, well, this is, the, this is what the good looks like. Uh, this is how you should live. But uh, Sidney says that because he's so abstract and misty to be conceived, you may wait in him until you be old ere you find sufficient reason to be honest. So you have the, 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 the philosopher, the historian, each one provides you with something important. Uh, the historian gives you the real, the philosopher gives you the ideal, but each not having both, do both, stumble, Sidney says. Now, here's why poetry matters. Here's why poetry is important, because the poet is able to combine both. Like the, like the philosopher, he's not limited to what actually has happened. He can imagine what ought to happen and, and what should happen. And he can give you a picture of that. But unlike the philosopher, he gives it to you in the form of a story, like the historian, that you can relate to and you can understand. And so uh, without the poet, without Homer and Virgil and, and Shakespeare and Milton and Lewis and Tolkien, uh, your education is incomplete. The poet is the one through his imagination who can put all, all that together mm -hmm. and give you a picture of the ideal that isn't abstract, that's concrete. It's in a story. You can relate to it and you can relate to the characters. So, so this is, this uh, is kind of bringing in uh, uh, Lewis's uh, comments about reason and imagination. Yes, they're definitely yeah. relevant too. Uh -huh. uh, Tolkien thinks we need pictures of uh, integrity, for example. I'll, I'll pick that particular virtue because it's relevant to Faramir. And Faramir maybe is the character who most clearly represents the divergence. Um, Tolkien gives you a character... Faramir, who says of the ring, I wouldn't pick this thing up if I found it lying in the road. And then Jackson transforms him into a guy who says, tell my father I send him a powerful weapon. Well, why? Well, Jackson doesn't think that a person with Faramir's level of integrity is fully believable. He thinks in order to make him somebody that we can relate to, he has to give us a complicated person who has a complicated path of getting to that place where somehow he's able to do the right thing. Uh, Tolkien isn't concerned so much with that kind of psychological believability. He's concerned with giving us a picture of integrity because if you're going to live up to it, you have to be able to imagine it. Uh, Tolkien said Faramir was the character that he most admired and looked up to, interestingly. Uh, but but the contrast between the, 
the Faramir of the book and the Faramir of the movie is 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 really nothing less than stark. But it flows from a different concept concept of what they're trying to do. Uh, if life is going to, at some point, ask you to make a sacrifice for integrity that uh, doesn't come naturally to you, then how are you going to rise to that challenge? You have to be able to picture it in order to be able to do it. And Tolkien uh, was able to picture it because he had lived it himself. Um, when uh, Tolkien uh, fell in love with Edith Bratt, who later became his wife, there was a period where his guardian, uh, Father Francis, was, af was afraid that she was uh, distracting him from his schoolwork. And uh, so he forbade Tolkien this man who Tolkien believed was in legitimate authority over him forbade him to see her until he was 21. At 21, he, be, he could make his own decisions. And so at midnight, and, and Tolkien obeyed, at midnight uh, on the day of his 21st birthday, he arose from bed because that was the first second that he was legitimately able to do it and wrote, started a letter to Edith uh, and they eventually got back together and were married. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's pretty impressive. I don't know that I would have been able to manifest that kind of integrity when I was uh, 18 or 20. Mm -hmm. uh, but Tolkien did. And so uh, there's a reality to his uh, own personal integrity that gets reflected in the characters. And uh, it, it's there the way it is, not because he was naive. He gives you lots of complicated characters, complex characters who develop like uh, Theoden, like Gollum, for goodness sakes. The, the inner conflict that Gollum goes through and it almost, uh, almost conversion that doesn't quite happen because Sam interrupts it. Uh, yeah, Tolkien can do that. Tolkien also wants to give you characters that are pictures of what would be a step up for us so that when we need to, maybe we'll be able to make that step. And mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things that literature gives you. Uh, it, it takes the ideal and the real and is able to bring them together mm -hmm. uh, in a way that people can find meaningful, in a way that people can find effective that history alone or philosophy alone uh, wouldn't quite be able to pull off. Okay, so um, I have some uh, series of questions that are coming here. So I'm, uh, that have come in. So I'm going to uh, give you a rapid fire of uh, questions, and then we'll jump back into some of the main themes. Is there a way to introduce the Lord of the Rings to the uninterested? Is there a book that weaves in Tolkien's life, faith, uh, fantasy, you know, that kind of thing? Introduce the Lord of the Rings to the uninterested. I mean, well, some some people just don't like fantasy, don't respond uh -huh. to it. Um, I'd like to think uh, that that my book could help in this for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, people, uh, fundamentalist Christians who have been scared off from Tolkien because uh, they think of him as the father of Dungeons and Dragons and the, and the occult. Uh, I, I think my book could help a person like that understand where Tolkien's actually coming from and remove some of the barriers to uh, its appreciation. Uh, but a, a person who, who basically has tried other works of fantasy and uh, just not, that's just not his cup of tea, uh, not everybody is going to respond to it. Mm -hmm. um, 
So there are, there are limits. Yeah. It depends on what the barriers are. Yeah, I kind of have to know where someone's coming from and what, yeah, as you say, what the barriers are. Um, right. Not yeah. everybody, not everybody can appreciate every form of goodness yeah. that there is in the world. And uh, God will have to reach yeah. some people by other channels. Well, maybe maybe uh, appreciation for Tolkien is uh, is uh, like the third work of the spirit. <laughs> uh, so no, uh, so somebody asks, and this could go pretty long, so we need to keep it. Did you enjoy the movies? Yes, uh, the movies frustrate me uh, because there are many things that they did extremely well. Uh, there are other places where I think, and some of the changes are changes you just have to accept because they're necessary in the transition from one uh, form of art, from one medium to another. Okay. Uh, in a movie, you're going to have to simplify things to a certain extent. Uh, you're going to have to combine some characters. That doesn't bother me a lot. There are other changes that frustrate me greatly because I think that they uh, they potentially lead to misunderstandings of what Tolkien mm -hmm. was trying to say. They're not insignificant. Yeah. But uh, so so you can't just hate the movies and be done with it. There's so many things they did so very well. Uh, but then I think it's important to read the books and have an intelligent understanding of. Uh, of the things the movies present well and the things that maybe uh, there's a different way of, of looking at them. I, I recall when the uh, third movie was first in the theaters. Okay. So uh, I go to see it. And uh, as people are leaving the theater, there are a couple of theater employees who were waiting for us to all go out because they were going to come in and, and uh, sweep and mop and clean up and everything, remove all of the, the garbage. And th these two uh, young ladies had obviously not seen it yet or read the books. And one of them said to the other one, this must be a really good movie because everybody always comes out of it looking really serious. Yeah. So such is the power of Tolkien's uh, vision that even in distorted form, it, it, it comes across. And so if the books get, if the, if the movies get people to read the books, <clears throat> that's nothing but good. Mm -hmm. um, and if you like the movies, if you enjoy the movies, hey, so do I. Mm -hmm. But I think it is important to be aware that at certain points, uh, the divergence from the books is actually significant. Mm -hmm. The orcs were cool. Uh, the orcs look like they're the first orcs that actually look like what orcs are, which is corrupted and ruined elves. Uh -huh. uh, you could see that in these uh -huh. guys. So lots of the visuals uh, were perfect. Uh, yeah. Minas Tirith is Minas Tirith. Uh, Habitan is Habitan, Bag End is Bag End. Uh, you know, uh, the one exception, I think, is maybe Rivendell. Uh, Rivendell isn't actually des described the way it is in the book. Uh, I, I, to me, that Rivendell was not the abode of Eldar, but of sugar plum fairies. <laughs> All fancy and scrolly. Uh -huh. Uh, Tolkien's Rivendell is much, uh, much different. Yeah, but you know we need to give we need to give Peter Jackson credit where credit is due. He made lots of changes. Some of them were necessary. Many of them were lame. Some of them I think were terrible. But he made one change that's actually an improvement. And so I need to give him credit for that. Um, the scene where Mary, where, where Aragorn meets. Uh, Frodo, Sam, Mary, and Pippin. And uh, then uh, they get the letter where which quotes the Bilbo's poem 
uh, about all that is gold that does not glitter, not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. Uh, from the from the ashes of fire shall awaken uh, the sword. The sword that will be reforged as it was broken. Uh, a light from the shadows shall spring, and the crownless again shall be king. I'm murdering the poem, but you'll all remember it. And Aragorn pulls the, his sword out, and it's broken. Not much use, is it, Sam? Now, it's like Aragorn is the most skilled outdoorsman and hiker in the world. I spent enough time on the Appalachian Trail. I mean, my skill is not even close to Aragorn's, but I've been on the Appalachian Trail enough to know no hiker who knows what he's doing is carrying one ounce of dead weight on the trail. If it's not useful, you're not carrying it. And no warrior who's being chased by all the servants of the enemy across the world is carrying a sword he can't use to defend himself. So when 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 Jackson shows that that the shards of uh, Narsil, before it's reforged into Andural, are actually in a little shrine in Rivendell, rather than than being carried around the world by Aragorn in his sheath. That actually makes more sense. The, the, the scene that Tolkien wrote was effective as a scene until you start thinking about it and what it would mean for uh, reality in the rest of the story. One of the few places where Tolkien actually didn't think it through completely. And uh, I have to admit, that one change that Jackson made mm -hmm. I think is, is an actual improvement. All right. Well, so we have a question here from a, vre a veteran who uh, asks. He says, uh, "I'd like to, um, I'd like to know whether Tolkien's battle accounts have been studied against his combat experience, and whether similarities and or inspiring events have been identified." Yes, they have. Short answer: uh, Janet Brennan Croft has written a book on Tolkien's war experiences. I think there's another book also about uh, World War II. Lots of people have noticed that Mordor is basically the trenches. Uh, the, the devastation of the countryside is reflected. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, that kind of scholarship has been done. Okay, um, you have a favorite quote uh, from J.R. Tolkien? Mm. Well, I've, I've tried to quote a couple of poems already and messed them both up. Let, let <laughs> me try one more time. The road goes ever on and on down from the door where it began. Now far away the road has gone and I must follow if I can pursuing it with weary feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet. Whither then? I cannot say. Um, boy, and now if I, if, if I started seriously trying to identify my single favorite yeah. quotation, uh, I would uh, frustrate myself greatly because it would be a very difficult yeah, usually people, you know, uh, when we ask uh, Lu uh, Lewis scholars, sometimes we say, what's your favorite Lewis book? You know, and they'll say, well, that depends this week or the next, the week before or what, you know. Uh, yeah, the one, the one I'm currently reading. is, and that, Yeah, and that's it too, as well. Uh, hey, uh, say a few words about the elves. What, you know, what? How does that come into the story, and what's the significance of the elves in uh, Lord of the Rings and the story? Elen sila lumen omen tievo, a star shines on the hour of our meeting. Tolkien said at one point that the whole reason Middle Earth exists is that he wanted there to be a world in which that greeting made sense. So, uh, I have a chapter on this in the book. 
uh, about Tolkien's philology, not philosophy, philology, philosophy, philo, love plus Sophia, wisdom, philo, logos, love plus word. Uh, Tolkien's a philologist, a lover of words. Uh, he wanted to create his own language. Uh, not just a code, but an actual language that would have its own grammar, uh, vocabulary, syntax, etymologies, etc. And uh, he thought that was the ultimate act of creation. And as he was working on this language, he realized that in order for it to really have the sense of reality he wanted to give it, it needed a people to speak it. That people needed a world to live in and, and other peoples to be related to so that they could have loan words like a real language does, et cetera, and so that it could change through time like a real language does, and you could have Kenya and Cinder and et cetera. And so Middle Earth was created because Elvish, the language, needed it. And... Uh, so the elves, uh, interesting. I mean, uh, what in the world are we going to call these people? I think it's it's usually better to call them Eldar or something because elf and elves uh, mm -hmm. is, is associated with lots of people in our folklore who are nothing like these guys. But um, they are the people who speak uh, elvish. They are the people who are the kind of people who would speak that kind of language. And consequently, uh, they had to have a world to live in and it had to have a history. And so everything in Middle Earth comes basically from that, uh, from Elvish, which is uh, in Tolkien's mind, the real center of his uh, creative work is the language. And that probably has something to do with why people always find Tolkien's uh, names so uh, just just delicious and satisfying how long did it actually take tolkien to uh, finish the Lord <clears throat> of the Rings? he was working on the languages and the history of middle earth and its mythology by the time he, he was working on that in the trenches to take his mind off of World War I. So that's the 19 teens. And uh, the uh, Lord of the Rings was published in the 1950s. So it's about 40 years. Uh, and he was hmm. working on, on uh, lots of it the whole time. And of course, then the uh, Silmarillion which is actually the original material. Uh, it's the older material. Uh, the prequel, the background to the Lord of the Rings, wasn't published until the 70s. So, uh, and at the time of Tolkien's death, it was unfinished. His son Christopher had to edit mm -hmm. it just so that we would have something. Mm -hmm. And the rest of his life, he spent bringing out all of this background material, 10 volumes of it. Fascinating stuff. So, uh, yeah, basically, Tolkien was working on it his whole life and never mm -hmm. finished. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> so Lisa Ellen Smith, who I know personally, mm -hmm. since I'm married to her, she uh, asks, uh, she says, I haven't read the books yet, but one of the my favorite lines from the movie is you shall not pass you remember yes Gandalf uh, she wants to know is that really in the book yes that one is uh, quite a few lines are not but that one is uh, uh -huh. yes uh, I had any number of students who said who, who were struggling in my course and said you know <laughs> uh, It'll almost be worth it for you to say that. Yeah. So, uh, okay. I never did, but. Uh. Uh, uh, so. Uh, some of them passed and some of them did not. 
um, that's actually a, a, that scene is very well done. Yes. Uh, you know, one of my favorites as well. But yeah. what do you think the purpose uh, the ring serves other than a main purpose? Oh, wait a minute. What do you think the purpose the ring serves other than a main purpose in the story? You find Tolkien, did you find that Tolkien meant to expose anything about the world? I don't, I don't think any of the attempts to make the ring an allegory or make it symbolic of some specific thing in, in the world or in history are convincing. Lots of people thought the ring symbolized the atomic bomb. Tolkien explicitly denied that. He said, look, that ring was created and invented before anybody knew anything about nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. This is World War one when it starts, not World War, mm-hmm. not the end of World War II. Uh, the the ring functions as a kind of a psychic um, amplifier. Okay, mm-hmm. and so uh, it. Re- I think if it represents anything other than itself, it's the potential for evil in the heart of man who knows Mm -hmm. what evil lurks in the heart of man the shadow knows and Tolkien knows Mm -hmm. so uh it's a symbol for our general fallenness i think but to, to make it something more specific than that uh Tolkien roundly denied that it should be used that way. I've also wondered, you know, uh, the idea of, uh, and this is this goes back to Augustine, the idea of pride is kind of the uh, the fountain of all sin. That taking the ring, thinking that I would only use it for good, you know, it, because pride is so much a part of who we are, we think that if we had the power, we would only use it for good. What we find out is it magnifies like you said, our fallenness yeah, and the particular what, weaknesses that we, that whoever has the ring has. Mm-hmm. Uh, Galadriel uh, is magnificent when she refuses it. Uh, that's a scene that's in the book, but I, I think it feels very different in the book. I mean, Galadriel should be a lot of things, but spooky isn't one of them. Uh, mm-hmm. But you discover from the Silmarillion, the prequel, that Galadriel was present when uh, Thingol succumbed to the temptation of the Silmaril, which led to the downfall of Doriath. She had seen somebody not handling that very well and and, and the, the terrible consequences of it. And she's been thinking about that for a couple of thousand years. Uh and thinking about it profitably. So when the ring comes, Frodo offers it to her. Uh, she, it's one of the most magnificent scenes in the book. I pass the mm-hmm. test. I will go into the West and remain Galadriel. And Gandalf, of course, wants nothing. Doesn't want to touch it if he can help it. Because he knows how susceptible he would be that uh, good intentions are not enough. Frodo's good intentions were not enough. I mean, he uh, would not have been able to destroy it had it not been, ironically, for Gollum mm-hmm. at Samothnar. Yeah, good intentions are not enough, and the ring rubs our noses in that truth. It really does. Uh, hey, let's uh, let's talk for a minute about uh, the relationship between uh, Lewis and Tolkien. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, w- what did uh, Tolkien think of Lewis's writings, particularly his fiction Lord, uh, Chronicles of Narnia? Tolkien, that- Tolkien liked Out of the Silent Planet and Paralandra. He didn't like Narnia. Uh, but I think people have gotten a uh, 
an unfortunately false picture of Tolkien's rejection of Narnia because uh, the, the, the public statements he made about it that have been recorded and reported uh, are what they are. But uh, later in life, uh, he gave a copy of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to his, I think it was his granddaughter, uh, which if, if he had thought they were bad books, he would never have done. And so he came eventually to realize that, that they were good. There was good in them that he just uh, personally wasn't able to appreciate. Um, he was more reticent than Lewis about, uh, about putting explicit uh, Christian content in the books, you know, there's nothing in the Lord of the Rings that corresponds to the stone table in Narnia. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the fundamentally uh, Christian uh, meaning of the Lord of the Rings is buried much further below the surface and is there in less in your face ways. That was the way Tolkien preferred to handle it. Uh, mm -hmm. Lewis wasn't limited by that. And uh, mm -hmm. so there are things in Narnia that are much more explicit than anything Tolkien would have written. But, uh, yeah, Tolkien came to uh, recognize the value of the Narnia books uh, and regretfully uh, was not able to enjoy them himself. Uh, but the initial negative reaction is is which was probably a little stronger than that is the one that most everybody knows about mm -hmm. and you uh in your book you have uh several of those quotes that come from george sayer and other people right. who knew. I, I go i go through all all the evidence including some stuff that's come to light uh, in later times that that really needs to be added to get the full picture mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so maybe uh, also just uh, you could say uh, a few words about the uh, Tolkien and Lewis's relationship, because uh, sometimes uh, people give the impression that they had a falling out and, you know, like ended up uh, no longer speaking to each other, friends, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, they uh, they were close friends uh, at the beginning and for a long time. Uh, Tolkien said that he would never have finished The Lord of the Rings were it not for, for the encouragement that came from Jack and his brother Warney. Uh, and uh, toward the end of Lewis's life, uh, that relationship cooled off to a certain extent. Uh, they weren't as tight as they had been previously, but... Uh, Tolkien wasn't real big on his relations, uh, Lewis's relationship with Joy, was he? No. Uh, Jack had spent, I mean, Lewis had spent the whole history of the Inklings uh, teasing Tolkien uh, because he was always having to leave the meetings and go home to be with Edith. Or, you know, it's like he actually had a life, unlike most of the rest yeah. of them. Yeah. Uh, and then, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, all of a sudden he's expected to accept joy in a way that, that didn't seem uh, parallel. So that, that was an, an irritant. Uh, Tolkien was disappointed uh, that Jack never came what he would have thought of as all the way to Roman Catholicism. Jack mm -hmm. remained a Protestant. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... Uh, through various circumstances, including Lewis's help, uh, the relationship was not as close in the last uh, five or 10 years of Lewis's life as it had been. Mm -hmm. But they both still uh, thought of each other as friends, had held each other in very high regard. And uh, uh, Tolkien was just absolutely devastated by Jack's death. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug Gresham, Lewis's uh, stepson, 
uh, said that Tolkien offered to take him and his brother in. Uh, mm -hmm. Because Jack and Joy had both died at that point. And that that mm -hmm. didn't actually happen. But but according to Douglas, the offer was made, mm -hmm. which is uh, the act of someone who's still a friend. Yeah, uh, so, Douglas. Yeah, there, there, there was... Uh, they had had drifted away from each other to a certain extent, but I think the estrangement, I think estrangement is too strong a word and the people have read too much into some of those things. Yeah, Douglas uh, told me, I, I had the opportunity to, to uh, have a conversation with him at dinner one time and mm -hmm. he, he said that uh, Christopher, uh, Tolkien's son Christopher, told him mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know where all this came from. He said, uh, I remember my dad went every week to visit Jack in the hospital when he was, you know, toward the end when he was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so anyway, um, you, you know, I just thought back on something that uh, in the book was very um, meaningful to me and it had to do again with the elves. What can the elves teach us about living in the world and living with that tension of um, experiencing beauty and, you know, and having hope and all that. And yet, you know, not having the full um, experience yet. Yeah, the elves uh, are immortal within the life of the world. And so their relationship to time is different from ours, but it's different in a way that I think brings out some, some parallels that um, this world for men is not our home. Uh, the destiny of man lies beyond the circles of the world, to use Aragorn's language. Uh, the, well, the elves are immortal within the life of the world. And so uh, it's hard to put your finger on it, but the passage of time is one of the things that that uh, affects us. Um, you think think about Robert Frost's uh, poem, "Stopping by the Woods on a Snowy Evening." Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Uh, my little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. There's this perfect scene. You're sitting there in the woods. It's peaceful. The snow's coming down and you can't stay. It ends and you have to move on. And with men, that happens very quickly. But with elves, it happens also. The elves have to give up Lothlorien. They have to give up Rivendell to, to, to cross over the sea and find their... I mean, they... Uh, the fact that time flows differently for them uh, makes us notice the fact that it flows. And... Uh, really uh, it accentuates the way it flows for us. And so th that nothing in this life can be held on to because time is going to rip it out of your hands. Mm -hmm. And that's not a reason to reject it, but to cherish it even more. As, as Shakespeare said, uh, this thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong to love that well, which thou must leave ere long. And so uh, men can't find their ultimate purpose in this world, in this life, mm -hmm. as we're living it now. And uh, 
I, I think the contrast between our experience of time and that of the elves uh, helps bring that into focus mm -hmm. in, some, in some interesting ways. It made me think yeah, of uh, understand. made me think of uh, Lewis's idea of joy mm -hmm. uh, that it creates a longing or you know desire. Uh, that realizes that even in the best experiences here, whether it has to do with marriage or art or music or whatever, it it uh, brings a certain level of satisfaction, but it also creates a longing for something that's never satisfied, you know, in this life. Mm -hmm. So, so what you're saying is the the difference in perspective that the elves present to us gives us the ability to see from the outside kind of uh, our own experience in a way that we might not see it from within. Yeah. It helps bring it into focus, I think. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and, and that was uh, another question I had about beauty, but um, same kind of thing, but I also wanted to, you know, comment on uh, Tolkien's idea of the you catastrophe. Hmm. From the essay on fairy stories, yeah, you think of a catastrophe as something bad. Uh, it's a technical term from literary criticism, looking at the moment in a tragedy when everything falls apart, that that tipping point mm -hmm. where the tragedy becomes a tragedy. And Tolkien puts the prefix "u" e u on front of it, the Greek word for good, uh, a good catastrophe. In, in other words, this isn't the sudden downturn toward tragedy, but the upturn toward redemption. Uh, and uh, Tolkien's idea was that uh, one of the, the characteristics of fairy stories is they have that moment where uh, some grace intervenes and uh, enables you to live happily ever after. Uh, you have to set it up so it looks like that can never happen, and then somehow it does, and uh, that moment must seem inevitable uh, once it has happened. Uh, it's like it had it had to be this way. Uh, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ is the eucatastrophe of history, uh, and be because. Out of the jaws of what looked like utter defeat flow uh, redemption and atonement, salvation, and eternal life, forgiveness, eternal life for us. So uh, one of the things Tolkien valued about uh, fairy stories was that moment of you catastrophe, uh, the, the sudden grace that everything is going to turn out okay after all and of course uh the the uh triumph after all of that struggle all that sacrifice all that suffering and then in ways that further and sam can't even take credit for because mm -hmm. uh but their faithfulness got them to the place where it could happen mm -hmm. And you go from Samoth Nara to the field of Cormallon. Uh, you know, it's about as strong in the Lord of the Rings as it is anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about in the Lord of the Rings, uh, you catastrophe um, where it looks like all hope is lost in Aragorn and uh, Gandalf and uh, I forget who they're about to ride out to be killed mm -hmm. and re they remember that. Well, no, actually Gandalf has promised that he's going to return with the army on the, at, uh, de at dawn the next morning. And so he comes over the hill, you know, and the whole scene there. Oh, that, that's at the battle of Helm's deep. Yeah. Battle of Helm's okay. deep. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, there are more than one moment of you catastrophe in the yeah. world. Yeah, that was uh, that was also in the movie. I thought that was really powerful. Um, so um, so we're we're uh, out of time here. Oh, and 
Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Elves? What we now? Can't, we can't do this immortally. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe in the fullness of the kingdom, yeah, we can we could actually interview Tolkien and. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be better than me. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that may be true, but you've done a great job this evening, and uh, appreciate your being with us this evening. And I want to remind folks that uh, next month in October, the 27th, we'll be having a discussion uh, based on deeper magic. Uh, and we will post on our website at uh, cslewisinstitute.org. Once we schedule the event, you'll be able to register then. And um, for those of you who are on our email list, we'll send out an email announcing it. Uh, the, the registration. And if you're not on our email list, you can uh, you can do that. You can sign up for it uh, on the website, or you can email me at b.smith at cslewisinstitute.org or Ashley Decker at a.decker at cslewisinstitute.org. And we'll put you on our email list. Mm -hmm. uh, and also KJ, um, Carl, who uh, introduced here, um, I think uh, k.johnson at um, cslewisinstitute.org. Um, and so uh, we look forward to next month. And uh, thanks to all of you who've uh, been here with us this evening. So with that, we'll say good night and hope to see you soon. Farewell, wherever you fare, till your iries receive you at your journey's end. Indeed. <laughs>